Okay, so I would like to formally introduce you to Faith Mukunanzi, who is based at the University of Free State in South Africa. And Faith is a postdoctoral researcher there under the Saatchi Chair um, in Human Development and Higher Education. Um, and her interests are in educational aspirations, access to higher education, uh, and the link of that interest with poverty and youth and migration. And currently she's uh, working on how educa uh, educational aspirations of young people in marginalised communities. Uh, and she's here for a week, and I know she's working with Melis on a research proposal in that area. So we wish them very well in that enterprise. Uh, and I would really like to now hand over to Faye. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you everyone for coming. I'm looking forward um, to a level discussion. This presentation really is based on my uh, PhD work, and I'm currently working on a uh, monograph, and I think this is, one, this is going to be one of the key chapters in the book, and I'm looking forward to your contributions on how I can make it look better or how I can change a few things. And having you um, introduce me, I would like to introduce my center again. So I come from the University of the Free State in South Africa, and we are a research group that focuses on higher education and human development. And we seek to do research that um, looks at how we can build a decent society and how um, access and success in education can actually contribute to that. And um, we also seek to critically analyze policy that is related to education, especially for marginalized and disadvantaged young people in South Africa and around African countries, especially migrants like myself who see themselves in South Africa. So um, just to start off, um, start by highlighting what this talk is going to be about. I'll speak about what influences this broader talk, and then I'll problematize the definition of refugee and Islam seekers in South Africa because it's very different to how it's defined in the European context. Then I'll go on further to um, look at the migration context specific to Zimbabwe and South Africa, and then how we understand the vulnerability of marginalized migrant youth in the South African context. Screen. It's just slightly difficult to read the, the screen. first screen. Full screen. Full screen. Mm. I can do that here. Yeah. Slideshow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. And then um, I'll look at um, the educational context in South Africa and the place that uh, marginalized migrant youth have in that. And then this is then where I say I contribute to rethinking educational aspirations where I conceptualize four types of aspirations based on the conversion factors and agency that marginalized migrant youth have in South Africa. I'll definitely be referring to some of the, the papers here where I'll be reading the extracts from the marginalized migrant youth just to, for you to understand the context and the stories that the young people were sharing. So uh, broadly, uh, the study is from um, a PhD project that looked at. Why am I not moving? Uh, okay. So the study is generally based on a PhD project where I was focusing on exploring the life and educational aspirations of marginalized migrant youth in South Africa. And when I started thinking about this study, I was seeking to look at refugee youth from. Uh, Kong, thank you. Oh, yes. We have a lot of refugee youth from the Democratic Republic of Congo, from Somalia, from Ethiopia, and from Zimbabwe. But then by default, I only got volunteers to participate that say from Zimbabwe, which is where I come from. And these young people stayed at a church, which is called Central Methodist Church. It provided shelter for refugee youth. 
And so I spoke to both men and women, although in the first instance it was very difficult to get hold of women participants, because in South Africa when you migrate as a refugee and a woman, you find yourself doing work such as uh, waitressing or domestic work. So it's hard to get hold of women migrants. But then after um, trying, speaking to the shelter leader, I did snowball sampling to find a few women that I could speak to. So that is generally um, how this talk is coming about. It was qualitative narrative interviews that I did with the migrant youth. There were 26 in total. And I used the capabilities approach. I'm not going to go into detail about the capabilities approach because you will see more of it because I use it to conceptualize the formulation of the aspirations that I have here. But the main concepts that I use are agency aspirations window and conversion factors. Like I said, it's very difficult in South Africa to really define what a refugee is and what an asylum seeker is and what is an economic migrant. And this is largely because South Africa has received a lot of what we call refugees, yet they are not refugees, but they're economic migrants. So when they get to South Africa, they apply for refugee status, when in essence they do not qualify to be given the refugee status. So we have been having that problem in South Africa, specifically for Zimbabwean migrants like myself. So there are those disparities on how we categorize what is a refugee, what is an asylum seeker. So in my study, I was specifically looking at undocumented migrants, people who didn't have study visas, people who didn't have refugee status, but most of them, they had asylum seekers payments. So what happens in South Africa is when you apply for refugee recognition, they give you a, they give you a paper which they call Section 22, it's an Aslam Seekers document that allows you to be in the country legally. And it says that you can work, you can study, but in essence, when you go out to look for work or you try to study with that Aslam Seekers document, it's not possible. So I have a letter here that I used in my PhD study that was written by one of the people who, who has this um, Aslam Seekers a document which is viewed as a refugee document by most of us and it says having arrived as a refugee within South Africa about three years ago I still hold a temporary asylum seekers document which I renew every six months this document legalizes my stay in South Africa it also provides that as an asylum seeker I'm entitled to study and work in South Africa sadly this entitlement ends on the document itself. On the ground, it's a different story. First, through this legal document, I have found it impossible to send or receive money anywhere in South Africa through the less costly ShopRite or pick and pay services. These are supermarkets that allow people to send money to um, their countries. Neither of the companies accepts Aslam Sikha's permits as proof of identity, although all legal details are there. They always demand a valid South African ID before assisting. Secondly, none of the South African banks accept Aslam Sikha's documents for the opening of a bank account. This means that although the government has accepted me as a legal resident and thus have allowed me to work, I cannot enjoy this right as I do not have one of the basic necessities, a bank account through which I may receive pay if I'm working. It is high time that private institutions respect such rights as the South African government has already done. And when the writer refers to private institutions, it also refers to universities, because most universities in South Africa, they do not accept or recognize Aslam Sikha's documents for you to gain entry. It does not matter how good you are. The only thing that they recognize is refugee status. And with refugee status, you're able to get bursaries, scholarships. For example, I know University of Cape Town, University of Johannesburg, they have scholarships and bursaries specific for refugee young people. But for majority of the migrants who are Aslam seekers, they cannot access such funding. So they found themselves in difficult situations. Uh, so I would like to show you a video. Like I said, I'm also a 
marginalized, I can call migrant from Zimbabwe. Although I did not migrate in this context that I'll show here, I'm very familiar and I relate to the challenges that uh, we're going to see in the video. And I also should say that this video was around 2009, 2010. That is around the time when I was starting to think about the study. And it was about four years after I had migrated to South Africa. You know, uh, the political and economic instability in Zimbabwe started around 2005, 2006, and I migrated in 2006. So these were kind of the conditions that most young people were migrating under. Although now it, has, it is different because of the political landscape, we know there is a new government, so most young people want to go back to Zimbabwe and they are not migrating in numbers, as we will see here. And also the political landscape has changed in South Africa. They have tightened conditions for anyone who seeks uh, refugee status or applies for political asylum through the asylum seekers documents. I'm very aware of the fact that they are no longer renewing asylum seekers documents for Zimbabweans because they say the situation has changed. So we have to go back to, to Zimbabwe. So it has changed drastically as of today because of the two political landscapes in the two countries. So I will play the video. So that is the, the end of the video. Like I said, I, I'm a migrant myself, and all the research that I do, I like to do research that resonates to my own personal experiences. But like I said, um, although this was not my exact experience, as a young person, then the question is, when we see such conditions, what does it mean for education? When you see people uh, queuing for food, no shelter, do we even think that they can think about pursuing higher education? So then the question is, what's, what's in this video that speaks about higher education? So my argument is that in a self seeking country like South Africa, self seeking in the sense that when you come into South Africa, we don't have um, refugee centers where people can go to and then you get access to education or you get access to free services. The central method is change that is spoken about here. It was one of the very few, if not the only places, where refugees or asylum seekers could actually go to to get shelter and food. So the question is, or the argument rather is, in the midst of all the challenges that young people um, face or experience in South Africa, there is really little knowledge or I can say little interest about their educational ambition. So this provides then the context for us to start thinking about what can be done in such situations to help young people access higher education. And why is higher education important? Higher education for me as someone who has benefited from it, it helps, it expands one's opportunities. It exposes you to the world. It increases your instrumental chances, for example, of getting employment. I wouldn't be here, for example, if it wasn't for access to higher education. So that is the, the background that many of um, the migrant youth are actually living in. Uh, very few people have been fortunate like I have been in terms of breaking through the barriers of these challenges that young people are actually experiencing. So while the argument is not necessarily that HE would, um, higher education rather, would automatically make migrants' lives far much better, but the argument is that it can and it has the potential to improve their lives. And not only their individual lives, but also the lives of their own countries. Like now, young people want to go back to Zimbabwe. There would be a uh, instrumental in terms of trying to rebuild the country. So that is the issue right now. And then how do we understand the vulnerability of marginalized migrant youth based on the video that I've just shown? It shows um, the high rates of unemployment. We saw how one of the young people, they highlighted how he was working for $8 a day. So in that $8, you cannot even afford accommodation, you cannot afford food, you cannot afford clothing, you cannot afford to send money back home, which is the reason why most of us migrate. We migrate because we want to make lives better for the people that we live back in our own countries, our families, our siblings, and our parents. We also see compromised um, living conditions. 
the young people that I spoke to during my PhD, they were sleeping in in the church, and most of them noted that they were actually using the stairs of the church. At that time, I think it was 2009, there were about 5,000 young people who were refugees that were living in the church. There was no space for everybody. Some of them were sleeping outside in the streets. And so that was actually a very big challenge. And also the fear of deportation. When the young people migrated, some of them that I spoke to migrated when they were 13, 14, 15, 16 years old. And you're not recognized as someone who can sign a document. So for most of them, they could not apply for asylum seeking documents because they couldn't sign. So based on that, then they were living illegally in the country. And some of them that I spoke to actually 18, 19, 20, but still they didn't have um, legal documents. Because, for example, if you would apply at the port of entry, which is Bay Bridge, uh, Bay Bridge is the city that separates Zimbabwe and South Africa. It's about 500 kilometers from Johannesburg, where all migrant youth want to go to, to find employment. So then you would have to go back every six months, like I read in the letter, you would have to go back every six months to get the document signed or stamped or renewed. And for that, you would need to have an income for you to be able to travel, which most young people don't have access to. So most of the time, they would have to be ducking and diving, fearing um, deportation. And then we also see limited access to basic services. Obviously, in terms of shelter, not everyone had the privilege of staying at the Methodist Church. So obviously, some who didn't have access to the church shelter had limited access to basic services. And also then, how does this speak to accessing higher education. It shows that there were many constraining factors for them to access higher education. And then in terms of providing the educational context in South Africa and the place that marginalized migrant youth have in South Africa, we have uh, in South Africa a national youth policy, but in the youth policy, only recognized refugee status have access to bursaries, funding, and for example, applying to mainstream universities. Aslam seekers, which is what most young people have, they have no access or they have no place in the national youth policy. And I would like to also introduce the unconventional ways of learning. While I was busy interviewing people at the Central Methodist Church, I came across um, a school called Albert Street School. So this school was started by the church as a way to, to help all the miners who had migrated into South Africa but found themselves with nothing to do. Many people could not employ them because they were underage. But we found at the church there were many refugees from countries like Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, Ethiopia, Somalia. People were qualified as in headmasters, principals, teachers, but they found themselves as refugees in that church. And then we had minors that were underage. So now the people at the church decided to make use of those resources, make use of the teachers to teach the children that were there on a voluntary basis. So then people started accessing schooling from grade one to grade five. And then it moved on um, up to high school. So although the school is not really recognized by the South African government, as a formal school, it is a way that helps young people to learn and keep them out of the streets. So now what they do is they register with the British Council. So if you study, let's say, for Form 4 or Form 6, then you need to get funds to register for writing exams under the British Council, not the South African um, Matriculation Board because the school is not recognized and the school is not funded by the South African government. So that is the issue. For those that have successfully completed um, secondary school at this Albert Street School, some of them have had the opportunities to access um, universities. For example, the University of South Africa is a long distance learning institution. You can apply using your Zimbabwean ID. You don't necessarily need a permit to apply. So most of the young people have actually used that method to access higher education. So based on the stories, that the young people um, shared with me and also my own experiences, my observations while living in South Africa. 
I conceptualize four different types of aspirations formation in this context based on different factors and different levels of individual agency. So they are resigned, powerful, persistent, and frustrated aspirations. And these operate within an aspirations window, which I, I say that it's the people that are around you at that time when you're aspiring. So these people can actually be motivating or demotivating you, or people who encourage you, or the stuff that you want to achieve at a particular time, and you think of ways how you can do it. So that's what I view as the aspirations window. To highlight um, higher educational aspirations formation, uh, rather than the rationale of this conceptualization or why I decided to come up with this conceptualization, is to highlight that aspirations formation, particularly higher educational aspirations formation, is very context specific. It is not the same anyway. It cannot be the same like in Europe and in Africa. And also it cannot be the same in South Africa and in Nigeria, for example. It's very context specific depending on what the individual has at that particular time and the resources that are available for the person at that time. And also it's very, very complex. And this complexity is um, as a result of the personal and structural factors that a person finds themselves at a given time. Today I may aspire to be a teacher, but tomorrow then I can decide, no, actually the resources or the people around me are not motivating me to do this thing, then you change your aspirations, and which leads to the fluidity of aspirations. So I normally try to avoid using the term adaptive preference because I think that at a certain given time or based on whatever one is experiencing, aspirations become fluid. They change from time to time based on what is available and what you can actually achieve. And then also it highlights that um, aspirations are influenced by intersectional factors. For example, when it comes to the issues of women, gender was an issue. They spoke about how they needed to take care of their children, how they were breadwinners, how they couldn't go to school because they had to work, and how it was difficult to get jobs, let's say, in the construction industry. Most young men, when they migrated to South Africa, they would get jobs in construction industry, pushing the wheelbarrows or mixing the mud, which women could not do. So really, a number of factors affect one's aspirations formulation. One of the factors that I think um, are key in terms of aspirations formation in this context, I came up with four broad areas, the economic, personal, social, and institutional. And the ones that I've highlighted in green are the ones that, according to me, I think are actually um, important in that particular category. In terms of economic factors, Unemployment we have seen was a factor and continues to be a factor. There is a high rate of unemployment, youth unemployment in South Africa, not only for marginalized migrants, but actually for South African youth themselves. So this is a key issue. For migrant youth, family responsibilities, most of them highlighted the need to send money back home. So definitely, before they think of what they can do for themselves economically, the first thing that they can think about is, how much can I send home this month? And limited access to bursaries as a result of lack of documentation. They were not recognized, so they could not um, apply for bursaries. And I've highlighted philanthropies um, green because I think it was one of the it's one of the very important things in terms of trying to encourage higher educational aspirations among marginalized migrant youth. We will see in one of the snippets that I will read how philanthropies can actually come in and help young people aspire. Well, I'm one of the people that benefited from um, someone who was a philanthropist and helped me pay helped me with my tuition fees. So that's why I think that is very important, especially in the aspect of economics. And then personally, individual background also plays a very critical role. 
Most of the young people that uh, migrated had experienced a lot of trauma, seeing that they migrated from Zimbabwe during the political tensions. Most of them noted that they had actually dropped out of school in Zimbabwe because they were now forced to take part in political activities or schools would be shut down, teachers were not paid, no one would come to teach them, so they decided they would rather drop out of school. So that background actually influenced that what they wanted to do when they got to South Africa. And because there were no parents in South Africa, they lacked parental support, which is very key in terms of trying to guide you in what you can do after high school. They lacked motivation as a result of, for example, the shelter, the environment. It was crowded. No one spoke about education or doing something related to school. So they lacked all that. All the young people that I spoke to who were actually doing something, whether in college, they had internal motivation, not external motivation. Age was a factor, particularly for women. Women indicated that... Um, after the age of 18, they couldn't really go back to school and start learning Form 1 or Form 2. That was too late for them. Most of them had children at that age, so they didn't believe that one would actually be able to go back to school at the age of 27 or 28. So that was a key factor. Socially, the living conditions, as I've highlighted, although living at the church was a very positive thing for most of the refugees or Islam seekers, the conditions were seen as a challenge in terms of motivating what one could actually do. What happened is that most young people would just wake up and roam around the streets. The way the church worked was that it was actually providing overnight accommodation. So during the day, because it's a church, so people would come during the day to pray. So during the day, you would have to pick up your stuff and put it somewhere, and then you leave. So what was happening is that people would just leave and roam around the streets, look for work, and don't find work. So that was the challenge. And then uh, affiliation and belonging. The issue of xenophobia was very high during the time that I did the study, and also in 2008. So most of the people, especially from Zimbabwe, they really felt alienated and felt they didn't belong in South Africa, although they would have rather been in South Africa than go back to Zimbabwe. Um, belonging was an issue for them. Exposure and networks. This was highlighted by the people that attended the refugee school. They noted that being at the school exposed them to things and professions that they didn't know. For example, we did, there were organizations that were aware of the situation of young marginalized migrants, so they would go there and give motivational talks. I remember there is a young person who said um, they would get uh, people from legal aid. The lawyers would come to the school and try and encourage them to work hard. They would have banks coming to, to sell the professions that they could actually do at the banks. So that exposed a lot of young migrants to different professions. And through that, they formed associations and networks, some of whom uh, they actually took up later. I know there is one of the young people that I spoke to who is actually studying law because he met a lawyer who asked him to come and shadow him while he's doing law. So we see that the issue of exposure and networks is very key. That's why it's also highlighted there. Gender also came up as a very um, negative influence in terms of what one could aspire to do in relation to education. Like I said, most of the young girls that I spoke to already had children. And because of the difficult situation of self settling in South Africa. If you get to South Africa, you're a young girl, you don't have a job, then you get a man who says, I can marry you and take care of you, then the chances are likely that you would say yes. So most of the girls actually experienced that. They met someone who was willing to marry them, then they got married. And institutionally, for me, what is key and what is important is actually making these Islam seekers uh, become legally recognized, offering documentation, which was actually not happening in South Africa. Most of the people that I spoke to noted that they had held Islam seekers documents for over five years. So meaning they were living in these challenging years for those five years. So 
So we don't, when you read uh, literature or when you go to the Department of Home Affairs to try and find out why these things take so long, they say they've got a backlog or they say it's difficult because Zimbabwean migrants are actually economic migrants, not refugees. So it becomes difficult in terms of categorizing where to put who. But anyway, for me, the argument is that as long as someone is in your country, it's better to legally or officially recognize them than have them as an illegal migrant because then you increase the chances of crime. If someone can't get employment, they can do other things. Whereas if you can officially recognize them, you encourage them to look for formal work. And then um, CMC is the Central Methodist Church. It was seen as a very important sector that contributed to uh, the capabilities of the young people. At the same time, it was challenging because it was not motivating. AESS is Albert Street School, the school that most young men went to. So this school was free run by the church, and it was open for everybody, but only men that I spoke to. From the 26 young people that I spoke to, only men attended the school. None of the women had gone to the school. And then access to NGO services was also seen as key. There was a year, I think it was 2007 and 2008, where there was an influx of minor migrants from Zimbabwe the young people. So what most NGOs did, like save the children, they would actually have courts at the border to try and receive those young people. So the, the young people noted that this was very important for them because at least then they could get food and then they could be transported to Joburg. The NGOs were aware that these young people wanted to go and look for work. So they would actually offer them transport to Joburg. So this was very key for the young people. On arrival in Joburg, then they would have NGOs that would help them, let's say, um, do CVs, uh, apply for work, or if you are harassed by a policeman, then you can go to the NGO, then they could help you. So those are the, these are the contexts that actually helped in formulating um, the aspirations that I formulated. So this is the interplay basically of the aspirations formulated. I have resigned aspirations which refer to opportunities for aspirations available but not taken up. I'll discuss this further in the next few slides. Then we have powerful aspirations. Aspiration, opportunities for aspirations um, also taken up. Persistent aspirations, someone keeps trying despite the odds. Then we have frustrated aspirations, where one would actually give up on the aspirations that they have. And these, like I said, are influenced by sectors that are social and structural, and they intersect with individual agency. In terms of resigned aspirations, which are opportunities for aspirations but not taken up, I have um, a story that I would like to, to read. And this is Rita's story. Rita is a 21-year-old woman who met a guy who wanted to, to marry her, and she took up the opportunity for marriage. So those aspirations, like I said, are placed um, in different points along two intersecting scales of positive external aspirations, but they are not uh, necessarily taken up. And while Rita really had an uh, opportunity to attend Albert Street School, she decided not to do so. She thought that getting married would actually do the job. And she indicated that when she was in Zimbabwe, she wanted to be uh, a till operator, I'm not sure what you call a till operator here, someone who works at a store, a cashier. Mm -hmm. That's what she wanted to do when she was in Zimbabwe, but she didn't have the money or the opportunity to do that. And she was not exposed to other professions. But now when she met her husband, who's 44 years old, uh, her husband's son is studying law. That's only when she discovered that there are actually other professions that she can do, but she believes it's too late for her to study law. 
so she cannot study law. So that's why I refer to that as resigned aspirations. So what do resigned aspirations tell us, or what does Rita's story really tell us? It tells us that um, Rita lost confidence in her ability to re realize her aspirations. And giving up on her valued aspirations, she now wants to pursue what she thinks would give her fast income, which is um, cosmetology, I think, beauty therapy. She has heard that if you do beauty therapy, then you can make a lot of money and it's fast cash. She's not interested in doing anything that is longer than six months because her intention is to make money and make it fast. So in terms of the real professions that we think are real professions, in terms of teaching, law, becoming a doctor, that is something that she'll never think about because it's not possible. She cannot be in school for more than four years. That is what Rita says. And then we have, I'll read Rita's um, example here. She says, in Zimbabwe, it was difficult to go to school because at times I only had two books, so it was a waste of time. I wanted to learn how to operate the till. I also wanted to go for attachment at wholesalers, but did not have the money to pay. I never thought of courses like law, teaching, or nursing. I saw that I did not have money to do that. Now I wish I could study law. I heard that it has good money, but now I would rather study what is simple. I don't want a course that will take many years or months because I want to get income fast. My husband thinks I should do their beauty course because he says it's the one that does not take long to complete and it has money. I don't know whether there is money, but I just want a good course. But I'm also afraid that I might get arrested on my way to college because I don't have papers. So that was Rita's extract. Um, powerful aspirations are placed, I place them rather at different points along intersecting ranges of positive, uh, positive factors or positive influence. And then they also have someone who's got high levels of agency. And I use Musa's example uh, to portray the conceptualization of powerful aspirations. Musa says, I realized then that there was no future in working for construction companies or doing gardening, so I decided it was better I go to school. I started in Form 1, where I had left in Zimbabwe. I did not have a rand in my pocket, and the guys who knew me from home were laughing and mocking me, saying, let's go to work. At first, I listened to them and thought if I found a job, I would join them. When I was in Form 2, that is when I found a job, but I only worked on Sundays, selling the Sunday Times. Sunday Times is a newspaper in South Africa. I completed my O-levels in 2011. I wrote five subjects, and I passed them all. My parents could not take me to school, so this was a precious gift for me. When I came back in February, after I had went to visit in Zimbabwe, I heard about a scholarship and I applied for it, and the response came saying, congratulations, you qualified. You now have a scholarship to study business management. I didn't have a laptop, and I have to study online, so I went back to where I sell the Sunday Times. There is a Catholic church there, and I talked to a man who goes to the church and told him about the scholarship, and he bought me the laptop. So this is where I was referring to the role of philanthropists, that there are people who are actually willing to help um, young people out there, but we don't know how many they are, and we haven't done any research to find out if actually people would be willing to help uh, marginalized migrant people. So what does uh, Musa's story tell us about powerful aspirations and their formulation? Like I said, powerful aspirations are very clear and powerful. And they can only occur when one is pursuing what he or she values in life. This control is in different aspects of one's life, such as emotional, physical, and psychological, accompanied by flexible social and structural conditions in terms of policies. For example, we can say that Albert Street School, access to Albert Street School helped 
Musa be able to attain his O levels. So that was a very positive thing. And he also didn't want to do construction work anymore. So he knew that there was something better that he could do. And that makes his aspirations very powerful. Then we go to persistent aspirations. Persistent aspirations, as I place them here, are at two points along intersecting continua between negative external influences and high levels of agency. So you may have, uh, like I'll read in the next abstract, uh, Elton's story. Elton studied, he passed his O levels and did environmental management degree, but he had to drop out of school because he couldn't afford paying it further. But regardless of that, he still has hope that he will be able to continue with his studies. Let's see his extract. He says, Albert Street School was opened, and I went there. We started with only three teachers. Then there were five, then eight. That is how we started learning. I completed my education there in 2010. I then registered for an environmental management program, but had to drop out due to financial problems. So it's financial problems that have made me to be stuck like this. But what I know is once I get a job that can give me a stable salary, like 3000 I can budget and continue with my studies. It's only that I can't get a better job that can give me such a salary. Right now I want to study project management. It's a short course that can give me a better job. Once I get a diploma in project management, then I can look for a job. And then once I get a job, I can pursue my degree. So I view aspirations to be persistent when an individual is exercising agency, but the social and structural conditions are such that it becomes very difficult for the individual to realize their aspirations. From Elton's story, I argue then that this type of aspirations is influenced by intrinsic motivation more than extrinsic motivation, although he has instrumental ties to what he wants to achieve. And Elton's situation does not suggest in any means that his aspiration of achieving what he wants is unachievable, but rather that it may take longer for him to achieve it, depending on changes in the structural arrangements. The interaction of high levels of agency and constraining structural conditions point to the role that personal conversion factors such as motivation and resilience can actually play in one's life. The final um, conceptualizing of aspirations that I've done is frustrated aspirations. So frustrated aspirations, I place them at different points along two intersecting continua of negative external influences, which can be social or structural, and then uh, low levels of individual agency operating also at a space of aspirations window. Like I said earlier, aspiration window can involve people that are around you at that specific time. Here's Albert's story. He says, I attended school at the shelter from grade six until grade 11. But the problem that happened is that the shelter became full and they told us that they would return us back to our homes in Zimbabwe. I did not want to go to Zimbabwe because I knew there was no one who would support me. I just left and decided I would not go to Zimbabwe. So I had to drop out of school in grade 11. Now I'm doing nothing. When I was still at home, I wished to become a doctor. As of now, I don't know what I will do. In the first place, I'm not sure if I will finish off my schooling or not. It's very difficult to have dreams when you do not have schooling. As of now, I will take anything that comes my way because I don't have a choice. And though I want to change my life, right now I don't have a plan how to do that. So, frustrated aspirations are characterized by lower levels of individual agency and negative influences of social and structural conditions, as we see. The combination and interaction of these two contexts has the potential to lead to a situation 
where an individual resigns their aspirations, and this resignation is accompanied by a lack of belief in oneself and in the social and structural conditions present. Similar to resigned aspirations that I spoke about earlier, these aspirations are influenced by diverse factors and may lead to low levels of agency and a lack of motivation by an individual. So this is how I've conceptualized the four different aspirations based on the different stories that I heard from the marginalized migrant youth. So what do these stories tell us? They reinforce what I said earlier, that aspirations are very context specific, they are complex, and they are fluid, and they are influenced by a number of factors which are intersectional. What does this conceptualization mean? For me, as the person who did the study, and as a migrant youth myself, and also for human development. For me, I think it directs um, human development initiatives. If such studies or such research can really be taken into account and taken seriously by different stakeholders, um, the influence, um, the sorry, the influence of external and internal factors on aspirations formation of marginalized migrant youth may provide direction for approaches of development interventions that are necessary for young people, for young marginalized migrant youth. And also, aspirations do have an agency and working role. I'm a perfect example of that. And this can be done in small scale development. It doesn't have to be huge projects. It can be individual development projects. And this is done by assuming a capability selection role and an agency unlocking role. For example, one can decide what capabilities are important for me to be able to achieve what I need to achieve and what action should I take for me to be able to get to where I want to go. And also generally I feel it's a mo there is a moral role for development for all groups in society. It doesn't matter whether you are a marginalized migrant or you are a woman or you are someone who lives in the slums of South Africa. Generally, if you are disadvantaged and marginalized, this type of study or if we look at human development from this perspective and understanding the nature of aspirations formation is not only important for individuals concerned, but also very important for structural bodies like governments and NGOs to direct policies of development that enhance individual and collective opportunities for development going further, both in African and um, non-African countries. Thank you. Okay, well, everybody, um, be comfortable now. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, questions for Faith, or, or thoughts, you know, or statements, or contributions you'd like to make? Thank you, Faith, for your talk. It was really interesting. And perhaps you mentioned this, and I apologise, but how many young people did you um, interview? 26. 26. 15, ma 15 males and 11 females. What sort of age? Uh, they were between <coughs> 20 and 27. There were many other ones that I spoke to, but because I was specifically looking at um, that age range, I didn't use the data of the other ones that I spoke to, 35, 36, yeah. and some of them possibly long term, if they were beneficiaries of higher education, perhaps returning to their countries of origin. Um, is there any data on that? Is, it, is anything collected on whether people have actually done that? Well, I haven't come across data that um, has done that. But, for example, in this context, for example, for me, my argument is that in this context, 
I may want to to go back home because the situation may be seen as stable. And if I do have a chance to go back home, I would definitely be an asset to, to my government and to my home country. Absolutely. Because they are, just like it's anywhere in the world, it's very competitive to get a job. In South Africa, if you are a foreigner, it's competitive for the local citizens anyway. So if I have an opportunity to go back home and be an asset and they really want to employ me, I would definitely be an asset. Although there is no literature really that specifically speaks to people who have done that. Yeah. I will add my thanks to it. Um, very interesting. Um, you talked about, in some ways, some of the benefits of higher education, yeah. um, about some of the gains. And I wondered if you've got any sense of perhaps what some of the factors are that might help people break through to get access to higher education. It's, it's very difficult to answer your question because the key issue in terms of accessing higher education is related to, to finance, which is difficult for whether you're a migrant or not, especially in the South African context. So we see the, the recent um, fees must fall protest by the South African students. They want free access to higher education, which in a way... If they do get the free access to higher education, it will not re relate to foreign migrants, obviously. So in terms of the, so, yeah, there are, there are a number of challenges which I also do not have responses of how they can be addressed, except of course the issue of documentation. I think for me the issue of documentation would be a breakthrough for migrants specifically, because you would have um, companies, not even government, let's say, let's say companies that are willing to sponsor people who have official recognition. So for migrant youth, the factor that would actually enhance their access to higher education would be being legally recognized. I would, you referred it on that last slide, for example, to external and internal factors. And I wondered what, how you would define the internal factors and the kinds of things they are, because it struck me that much of what you talked about was kind of external constraints and mm. structural factors. Well, internal factors, I, I was referring to individual motivation mostly, because I, I do believe there's, anyone has uh, some if you think about what you really want to do in life, you would have an idea of how you want to get there. And so the basic thing is for you to act, decide individually that I'm going to act this way. Although, the, for example, the external conditions are not very conducive. Internal motivation, and also it would include uh, things such as gender, for example. That, that's a very personalized type of conversion factor, and um, gender in the sense that as a woman, I would decide I'm not going to do architecture, I'm going to do nursing. Those things, those type of socializations, they influence what uh, women would actually decide on, on doing. So those are the internal conditions that I specifically refer to. And another internal factor would be... Um, Let's say, are you someone living with a disability or are you someone living without a disability? It would influence which university you go to, does it have access to those facilities? It would influence what you're passionate about, do you want to, you know, those kind of things. So it's stuff that is within you that you cannot change, that no one can influence. Okay, so I, I, I'd have a, a different view of those things, so I wouldn't mm -hmm. see motivation necessarily has been internal because there's mm. the many other factors that shape how we respond to things and what approach we go for or um, what we aim for is influenced by the social context mm. and uh, yeah, I mean all the things you talked about for example seem to me to be influenced by external constraints mm -hmm. and similarly the gender you know I wouldn't say that was an internal I'd say that was a, you know, a social structural category mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so it's, it's worth bearing in mind, maybe, for your chapter, how you think about framing internal, because I, I wouldn't, 
Okay. Internal. What would be your ideas of something that is internal, if I may ask? Um, I don't know really whether I would frame them as internal mm -hmm. factors really at all. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, and, and similarly with inter, I, I think with motivation, motivation is not something that I guess you're going really into. Um, but the kind of distinction between intrinsic and extrinsic, I don't think is, is straightforward either. Um, so, why don't we talk more about that? If you want Thank you. <laughs> well, I, mean, yeah, I'm sure. yeah, I, I certainly wouldn't define the things you've mentioned as, as internal. Yeah. And, okay. Might perhaps lead to the capabilities of coach and individual and anything. But Mel, if you look like you were leaving. No, no, well, okay. I'll, I'll tell it. Uh, well, mine was really just a thought. It was just something that struck me really. And um, that piece about you read about Rita. Okay. Um, it just struck me that all it was all about obviously her aspirations and, and how that had changed. But it was that final sentence suddenly sort of just leapt out that actually seemed to underpin everything else. It was about her fear, her fear of being arrested. So in spite of, sort of everything else, I just wondered how much that really overrode um, all the other factors. Uh, it, it goes back to the issue of um, documentation. Yeah, yeah. She said that, yeah. Yeah, that yeah. So if, if for me, for all the young people that I spoke to, that was the key issue. If they could get documentation, then they're free to go where they want to go. They're free to access the universities. They're free to get jobs. They're free to do anything that they really want to to do. Although not all of them really referred to being scared of really working in the streets because they are used to meeting the cops and they are used to being taken to the police station and then you have you have the NGOs that come and bail you out and speak on your behalf. So you have those conditions, but for Rita specifically, because also maybe because of lack of exposure, she's, she was not aware that you have NGOs that can actually stand for you when you get to the police station or they want to deport you. I'm just asking to um, understand the context so that you can ask the questions. I believe that dignitary needs for why people are limited, right? Is that correct? I mean, South African context. I know that the UN is doing lots of work over there, but um, when I'm thinking of Terry and Aid, sort of an aid coming from UN and you know, United Nations bodies, and then the NGOs mm. and the charities. Are there any, you know, like the charities or NGOs that operate to help embodying refugees? Because, like, NGO concept is very much political. Yeah, you know, I know. Yeah. Okay. Specifically, Zimbabwe ref refugees or refugees in general? Well, refugees in general, but even if they seem to help the refugees, we know that they all have an underpinning, you know, like a political agenda that they prefer to help some sort of refugees more than the others. Well, there are not many. They are not. They are not many. Um, charity organizations that do that. If they are there, they are more like um, faith-based organizations. Yeah, you have the, let's say, the Salvation Army, you have the Catholic Church, you have the Baptist Church, you have the, I think it's the Jesuit for Refugees, I'm not sure if it's a, it's a faith-based organization. Those are the major ones, faith-based organizations. And then we have the uh, they sell the legal aid. It is government-based, but whatever they provide is very limited. For example, they would provide um, uh, legal services, but not access to food, shelter, or whatever. So they will just represent you, let's say, when you have to go for a court case. What about faith-based organizations? Would they make a discrimination, or not a discrimination, but sort of segregation between denominations of religion? like? No. Okay. That, it's open for everybody. That, you know, in the context that I'm working, yeah. the charity and NGOs are so much yeah. sort of politically polarized mm -hmm. that they will seem to be helping Syrian refugees, but the whole politics of whether those are, you know, like Arabic, Kurdish, okay. or which, you know, like denomination of religion are they coming from, or which part of, you know, like whether they're supporters of, you know, no. or not. So these. All the all small dynamics that play a role mm -hmm. in um, sort of determining who gets which community mm -hmm. to what extent. Mm -hmm. No, we don't have that in South Africa. No. 
there is no segregation, if you would, if you want to call it, okay. um, because we had, well, I think during the height of the xenophobic attacks, we had really Muslim organizations that were feeding everybody, whether from whatever faith they're from, mm -hmm. they would feed you, they didn't really mind where you're from as long as you're a refugee or Aslam Sikha. And I believe that there's a huge network between these Zimbabwean refugees as well, trying to help each other, no? Because we often think that they're based on humanitarian aid, but I think when we just go and look at the picture, it's you said it's not true, you know, they have a huge social capital of networking, and they don't necessarily always depend on humanitarian aid. Because humanitarian aid is very limited. Okay. It's, it's not really something that you would leave Zimbabwe and say, I'm going to go to this specific organization. It's by chance that you would actually get access to the services that they provide. And often it's not long-term based. They often provide services during xenophobic attacks, those type of periods mm -hmm. when migrants are unstable. That's when most of these organizations come to the fore. So generally, yes, they use a huge type of social capital among Zimbabweans themselves, not only Zimbabweans themselves, I mean even Somalis and Ethiopians, they, they use type of, um, they help each other get around the country. Yeah. So as a, and my last question is that as a highly educated, you know, Zimbabwean refugee, I'm sorry, not refugee, sorry, migrant, um, <laughs> would you say that there is um, the aspera of formation among highly educated migrants? Is there? Is there a diaspora formation among highly educated Zimbabwean migrants? I mean, do you think higher education also leads sort of this kind of diaspora formation as well? Would I add another category to the four that I have? No, I'm just asking? asking the situation in, in, in South Africa. Sorry, I'm, if I'm coming with difficult questions. No, it's not, it's not a difficult question. I'm really trying to understand. But whether you know, like, um, there is a formation of diaspora of Zimbabwean? Diaspora. Yeah, exactly. Dias diaspora. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, of educated Zimbabweans. Because one of the, you know, like, in refugee context, the yeah. higher education is that it leads to this kind of uh, for us where they sort of, you know, like, um, help the grassroots movement and start to, no. you know, like, watch the interest of their own, you know, nation in that piece. No, that doesn't exist. Okay. Yes, no. We actually, you actually see that they, they become um, an elite group of the, the, Leonard, the Leonard, you know, but they, they're, they're doing nothing to try and help people in the grassroots level. Okay. Yeah. And also, for, for most people that are from Zimbabwe that migrate to do higher education in South Africa, most of them, they would be going for postdoctoral opportunities, sorry, postgraduate opportunities, mm -hmm. because they, they qualify they qualify. You'll find out sometimes in, in the South African context, not everyone wants to go to, to do a PhD, let's say. Mm -hmm. So you would receive applications from around Africa. So that's why you would see most uh, PhD students or postdoctoral fellows that you would find in South Africa, most of them are, are foreigners, not only Zimbabweans, but foreign nationals. And in the time that I was studying my undergraduate degree, People from Zimbabwe that were paying for themselves mm -hmm. were from the elite government, maybe government uh, type of children, not the general Zimbabwean people. Thanks, thanks for that, Faith. I'm, I'm interested in this sort of idea of what education is doing, what sort of what sort of skills and capabilities it, it's adding to the sets of skills and capabilities that those young people already have or are developing. And it seems to me that they, that many, many of the people, that, young people that you're talking about there probably have quite high levels of problem solving abilities. Um, you know, it strikes me from the, from the four descriptions that you gave that actually they're using capabilities like problem-solving skills, metacognitive skills in particular ways, and some of them are using them in, in certain ways depending upon yeah. the context that they're in. Mm. So I'm wondering actually what it is that the education or the higher education is, is adding. What is it offering that is that goes beyond those sorts of abilities? Is it something that, that, that is 
that is enhancing those abilities, or is it something that goes on top of those around them? What, what is it adding? Well, I, I think the key thing that um, access to higher education would add is instrumental potential, being able to be employed wherever you go. And that is the key thing, because if you see really, I just didn't include this in the slides, the, the, the valued functionings or the desired achievements of these young people, they are, most of them are instrumental based. They want to get a better job. Um, to be rebuilt, the society help their parents. So it's more of an instrumental role, and also it develops their critical thinking abilities. Yes, they all already have these skills, but they can be developed through access to higher education and exposure to different things that they may not have been exposed to. And most of these young people that I'm speaking about are from rural type of backgrounds in, in, in Zimbabwe. So when they come to South Africa, which is urban, they get exposed to, let's say, professions such as information technology, something that one may not have been aware of. They get exposed to professions such as media and journalism. Most of the young people don't know these things exist. So obviously through going to Albert Street, Street School, which is not a university, but just a high school, they get exposed to these things. So what else can access to university do for them if the high school can do that for them? Yeah. So, so the sort of um, the development of sort of um, adaptation, adaptability, is, 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 seems to be there, i.e. that there's um, actually their, their ability to do that may, may, have, may give them quite a big advantage. I don't know whether you've seen that in terms of in terms of the young people that you've spoken to, and, you know, whether those sorts of qualities come through in particular ways that yes. that CPM. Yeah, yeah. We have um, there are a number of them that um, although they are not really now in, in, in university, like what I really argue for access to to higher education, we have some of them that are actually running their small businesses. Let's say something like helping you web design. Someone is interested in web design, so they start learning how to do web design, and then they help you do web design. I know there's one guy who's now a DJ, you know, a disc jockey, because he was very interested in journalism, but he couldn't access university. So now he's starting to play gigs around the city. So you do see those type of aspirations coming into action, although it's not necessarily through university access. Interesting. Following on to that, I, I really picked up on that quotation about it's very difficult to have dreams when you do not have schooling. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore, in a way, the, more, the logic is that the more schooling you have, the more dreams you might have. And in a way, mm -hmm. that's kind of what you've been discussing, isn't it? That the mm -hmm. horizons open or, or, you know, they're just simply, they begin to know about more possibilities, different kind of jobs that they've simply not ever dreamed about before, different kinds of, that's jobs, I mean, do, do they have, does it, do they get a thirst for more education as well, I and mean, that's another, so, do, do other than instrumental, yes, 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 yes. yes. I mean, almost all the men that I spoke to really want to get an education, so that they can get um, respected from where they come from, so that they can be respected by local citizens, because they feel that because they are not educated, then anyone can say anything to them, anyone can do anything to them. So yes, well, it's instrumental, there are instrumental reasons for them to want to go to university. There's also an intrinsic um, value that they want to get out of it. So it's quite, it's quite dynamic and, yeah, varies. Very fluid, very fluid. I have, uh, thank you for your interesting uh, uh, excerpt from the interview. And I uh, am curious about what kind of social status that are they going to get after finishing the, the university degree? Like, is it going to be the um, just at the living standards or the more higher than the level? 
social mobility, uh, just social just status. Yes. You're saying social status. And you're asking what kind of social status they may get if they access yeah, or higher if education. They, if, what kind of social state that they want to get it? Well, um, most of them, they really want to get at different things. And I think this is influenced by the, the personal experiences, including trauma of being a um, refugee in a foreign land and also running away, for example, running away from home and now your village thinks that you are a failure. So now what they want to do is that socially really, they want to be recognized as people who are, who are not failures, people who actually are able to achieve. So what they say is that, well, in the next 10 years, I want to be seen as somebody because right now people don't see me as anything. You understand? So they want that recognition that they are able to contribute to society, whether financially, economically, or most of them want to go back home and build schools to help people in their villages. So they want recognition. That's definitely what they want, in addition to the instru instrumental value of education. We feel as if we've come to a natural end. Has anybody got any questions there, Bernie, to ask or contributions? Yes, please, contributions. <laughs> I, would, I would really appreciate contributions, definitely. I guess, you know, after this event, mm -hmm. um, do we have a, an email uh, address for you? Um, um, can you help us there? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. if anybody does have a you know, particular comment that they'd like yeah. to make to help Faith with this chapter, yes, definitely. you could email her, couldn't you? Yeah, yeah. 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 of course, and I will yeah. uh, maybe circulate or email around. Is that okay for you, Faith? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Just like yes, yes, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's perfect. So I'm, so I'm just going to send to address, you know, like our department an email saying that we have further questions to follow up. Right, then she's going to be here until Friday. Yes. Yeah. And she's located in an office. Yeah, uh, she's in Chelsea Studio office. Um, the office just across the chat room. Next to Rebecca. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Well, I guess I have to make another comment. Although, um, although this formulation is specifically for um, marginalized migrant youth, I would really would love to hear your thoughts, maybe via email, if you think this is applicable to any disadvantaged context, not necessarily marginalized migrant youth, because that's something else that I'm trying to think about, that I don't think this necessarily refers to or applies only to refugees or Islam seekers, but it can be applied to different contexts of marginalization or vulnerability or disadvantage. Let's thank Faith again. Thank you everybody for coming. Thank you.